Well, let us worship God and sing to his praise from Psalm 70. And we'll sing the first version of the psalm to the tune Serenity, which is tune number 174. So worshiping our great God and Savior with the use of the first metrical translation of Psalm 70, the whole psalm to tune 74. Notice the second half in thee. Let all be glad and joy that seek for thee. Let them who thy salvation love say still, God praise it be. I poor and needy am, come Lord, and make no stay. My help thou and deliverer art, O Lord, make no delay. God's face together in prayer. Our gracious and eternal God in heaven, the great God of glory, the God who dwells above the highest heavens, indeed must condescend to look upon this world which is a footstool. We give glory and honor and praise unto thy name. And we come in the strong and precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ the one through whom alone we have access into the courts of heaven with acceptance, and we rejoice in him who is the once and final sacrifice for sin, who has shed his blood and offered his body as a sacrifice in order that we might enter in through the veil. And we are thankful, O Lord, that we have these privileges preserved and kept to us, uh, to be able to assemble together and to call upon thy name. We ask for uh, thy presence to be given to us, that we would be conscious that it is the sovereign God with whom we have to do and before whom we bow our hearts. Uh, grant that we would indeed extol uh, that sovereignty and, and confess that there is nothing that is outside of the control of your hand, that, O oh Lord, you are directing all things according to the counsel of your own will, that your purpose is firm and fast, that it is immutable. And we rejoice, O oh Lord, that we have uh, a God who is, uh, all, is unchanging, that uh, amidst the fluctuations that we find within ourselves and within the world about us, 
that we can call upon our God as a rock, as the rock of our salvation, and grant that we would have hearts that when uh, the waves uh, seem to overwhelm us, that we would be enabled with the psalmist to look to the rock that is higher than any one of us. And we ask that as we gather again this, this afternoon to worship, that we would be enabled to worship in spirit and in truth, uh, that we would take up these best of all songs, these holy and perfect songs that have been given to us from heaven. Uh, make them the cry of our hearts, that as we, as we sing praise, as we sing, seeking by promise and petition for our needs, and even as we sing uh, imprecations, uh, curses and judgments to be brought upon real people in real time in history, the enemies of God, that our hearts would be in these things, that we would sing them with faith and with godly fear and with an eye uh, to our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, bless, we ask our, our desire to humble ourselves under your mighty hand. Uh, grant us help in this often difficult and arduous work of, of uh, humbling ourselves with repentance. How foolish we are, O oh Lord, uh, to not love repentance as we ought, to not prioritize repentance all of our days as we ought. And we, are, we, we O oh Lord, are, are those who, who are given to daily and habitual uh, repentance, called to such. Uh, help us in these days of uh, affliction and turmoil and unrest and uh, difficulty in the country at large to see through all of the craziness that is about us, to see what is uh, at the center of all of this in dealing with the church. We pray that we would, uh, in, in, in the secret place and in, in, in publicly in our gatherings, that we would have hearts which are truly broken. Lord, hearts that truly are contrite, hearts that tremble at thy word. Lord, we desire broken hearts. We desire to be uh, convicted of our sins. We desire, O Lord, to turn from them, uh, to do turn our hearts that they might be turned. We confess, O Lord, our pride and our unbelief and our selfishness and our idolatry and our spiritual minimalism, our coldness, complacency, uh, our indifference to what matters most, our preoccupation with time and sense and the things of this world, our desire to have our way and our rights uh, rather than to bow with submission uh, to, to thy way. Lord, we confess that all of our sins are treason and ought to be decried as such and we ought to stand to testify against ourselves, to condemn ourselves, and to justify and vindicate uh, thee. O oh Lord, bless us in this. Look with, uh, look with uh, favor in your eye and grant that we would uh, know something of the grace that abounds to those who are humble, who have been humbled. Grant, Lord, that we would know the increase of the joy of salvation, to see all that we have been saved from, to truly rejoice that we have been, that those who know the Lord and who are truly in a state of grace uh, have a full and free salvation. And Lord, may this be our joy, not the preservation of our temporal cares. Uh, may we not even like the disciples rejoice that the that we, have, that, that we have power over the demons, but that we would heed the voice of the, of the Savior, that we would rejoice chiefly in this, if our name is written in the book of life in heaven. Lord, we pray uh, that uh, a thorough work would be done in our souls collectively and individually. Do bless, we ask, the, the Church of Christ at large. We do feel heavy. We're grieved, Lord. We're grieved to see uh, the departures of Zion. We're grieved to see uh, the waywardness. We see it in ourselves. We see it beyond, and we, we pray, O oh Lord, please stay the tide. Whatever comes of the 
virus and whatever comes of the infrastructure of our nation, whatever comes that may follow that, grant us this one petition, grant that the church would be turned, purified, reformed, revived, made truly holy, her walls erected to the glory of God, uh, to be of such that glorious things would be spoken of her. Grant that the kingdom which is not shakable, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which no military power can destroy, no virus can, can destroy, uh, nothing is able, O Lord, to dismantle this kingdom of which even the gates of hell cannot withstand. Bless, O Lord, this kingdom. Make it glorious for our Redeemer's sake. Make it uh, to serve his interests, his priorities. Uh, grant, O Lord, that the church would be a place where Christ is extolled with great vigor and earnestness. And forgive us, O Lord, for all of the departures. We have, we have rather than having been a light to a dark nation, the light has been hid under a bushel. Indeed, in some cases in these recent days, the light has gone out. Lord, grant that you would help us, that, that this little candle with its little flicker might yet shine, not for ourselves, but for the glory of the Redeemer. Bless us, O Lord, in our care of one another, as the house of God, as brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, as those who are called to love one another. Bless this mutual ministry and support. Look with mercy upon those who are sick and laid low, that they would be finding to their surprise and delight that you have provided them in what would have been an unexpected place, that you would provide with them, O Lord, a full portion, that they might find themselves full and overflowing with the bounty and blessing that God bestows even on his afflicted people. Be a shield to us, protect us from... Uh, if it be your will, protect us from sickness, uh, protect us from being disrupted by authorities who refuse to kiss the sun and who do not promote his interests. Uh, protect us, O Lord, from our own carelessness. We pray that uh, you would be merciful to us. Grant us, O Lord, what we cannot ever deserve. Grant us mercy. Bless us in our worship this day. May we have renewed vigor after this lunch hour. May we have uh, grace stirred up within our hearts to seek the Lord with strength. Bless us in the ministry of the word. And may you, O Lord, speak to us uh, that thy sheep would hear the shepherd's voice and follow him. And we pray that in all that is done, that the glory would redound. Uh, unto the Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray these things in his name. Amen. We come in our sequential singing to Psalm 59 and verse 6. So we'll pick up where we left off this morning. Psalm 59, verse 6, verses 6 to 12. The tune is Bangor, which is tune number 29. So Psalm 59, beginning at... Uh, verse 6. And this is, as you heard this morning, a, a psalm of imprecation. And my friends, you are called upon by God's grace to sing this with as much faith and affection as we do uh, psalms where we're seeking God's blessing upon his church. We want our wills bent to God's will. And we want to love what he loves and hate what he hates. And we desire, for the sake of his own glory and justice, that he would indeed punish uh, the wicked. So let's sing verses 6 to 12.
us worship God in the reading of his word. Our Old Testament reading is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, but by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense and money is a defense, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider. God also hath set the one over against the other, to the end that man should find nothing after him. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldst thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldst thou die before thy time? It is good that thou shouldst take hold of this, Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee, for oft times also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things, and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death a woman, whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Amen, and may God bless this reading of his holy and inspired word. Let's continue to sing together in God's praise from Psalm 59, verses 13 to 17. Psalm 59, verses 13 to 17, to the tune Storn Away, which is tune number 135. 
At the end of the psalm we sing, but of thy power I'll sing aloud at morn thy, pr thy mercy praise, for thou to me my refuge wast and tower in troublous days. O God, thou art my strength. I will sing praises unto thee, for God is my defense, a God of mercy unto me. Singing from verse 13 to the end of the psalm. New Testament reading is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, uh, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, 
but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the first book of the Bible, where we come in our course of sermons this afternoon to Genesis chapter 3. We'll be considering, with the Lord's help, verse 6, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Well, we have been working our way through Genesis of late, and we've seen in the first two, two chapters a, an account, uh, an inspired and infallible account of the true history of God creating the world in the space of six days and all that took place. Chapter 2, especially amplifying and expanding uh, upon all that we know and have been, have had revealed to us about man made in the image of God and of man being brought into a covenant of works with God and the creation of woman as a co-heir with him. And we have now come to chapter 3, and we noted last Lord's Day in verses 1 to 5, uh, the transition that is beginning to take place in chapter 3 from creation uh, in the direction of what, as you know, became man's fall, the fall of mankind, of Adam, and of all of his posterity. And we noted last week uh, how the stage was set with the temptation that Satan came with through the form of a serpent and the enticements that he brought to Eve. And we pick up this afternoon in verse 6, where we continue in that same vein, now turning uh, to the woman and her actions, um, as well as to the actions of her husband, Adam. We see here both temptation and the fall. And for those who, who may be tempted at times to have uh, light views or small views of the nature of sin, one healthy biblical dose to banish uh, these terrible inclinations is to go back to the very beginning and to read, as we do in this text, of the first sin. It was John Owen who said, He that hath slight thoughts of sin never had great thoughts of God. Slight views of sin are incompatible with great views of, of God. And so we see here the fact that uh, Adam has lost sight of God, and he is not the one that is occupying his attention. We have true history here. And the outworking of what will set the stage for the trajectory of the whole human race. We're going to note three things uh, this afternoon as we seek to unpack verse 6. First of all, the nature of this temptation. First of all, the nature of temptation. We've noted that man was created in an estate of innocence. So he was endowed with spiritual knowledge, holiness, and righteousness. And he had all that was perfect, right? There was no blemish, there was no fault in him, no sin that was to be found in him. But he is not God. He is a creature, not the creator. 
And as a creature, he is mutable, right? Immutability is an attribute of the divine being and not one that is shared with creation like wisdom or love. Man was made mutable in his creaturely capacity. And he was created with freedom of will. So most of our children will know their, their passes from Augustine, and it's summarized in our own confession, uh, the four stages of history with regards to the freedom of the will and how in the garden man had both the ability to sin and to not sin. That fallen man does not have the ability not to sin, right? He can only sin. That the Christian, after they are regenerated, has the ability to not sin. And then, of course, in glory, man, the, the Christian in glory does not have the ability to sin at all, right? So we're at the beginning, and we have Adam with the ability to both sin and not sin, liberty to follow the path of life, which was set before him, uh, symbolized in the tree of life, or the path of death, which was also set before him in the curses of the covenant of, of works. You recognize that there's, there is uh, a position that Adam finds himself in that is tremendously uh, significant. Satan only has the power to tempt him. Satan cannot force or compel him to sin, but he does have the, the power to, uh, to lay snares for him. Adam has the ability in his original state to choose a power in himself for both good, to choose good or evil. And that, as you know, and as I've just reminded you, was lost after the fall. So that after the fall, man has no ability to do what is good, no freedom of the will to choose God or to seek what is good uh, in itself. There are none righteous, no, not one, none that seek after God, none that are good, as you know from Romans chapter 3. We also see that, uh, that God, only God, had the authority to say what was right and wrong. We saw it in chapter 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So God is the one who has inherent authority. And therefore, for Adam uh, to, to transgress his law, to eat the forbidden fruit, would be to defy God himself, God's authority. You'll note that Satan had focused um, on God's word. We noted how he twisted it, the subtlety, the, the, the cunningness, and how, how he, he twisted the, the scriptures and mis, misrepresented them. All of this kind of sets the, the background. And, you know, some will think to themselves, well, it's such a little sin. I mean, there's he was told not to eat the forbidden fruit, one fruit from one tree, you know, in contrast to murder or genocide or, or other such things. Uh, the foolish will think to themselves, well, it's such a little sin. You know, it's like a, uh, a, a white lie, as people so often describe it, and, and so on. What is so great? Why so great the consequences? Because after all, eating the forbidden fruit resulted in death. It resulted in death for Adam, death for Eve, and death for the whole human race. Spiritual, physical, and eternal death, apart from the Redeemer. Well, the reason is because sin is, is to be seen in light of who it's against. You know, we in our very man-centered world, our little man-centered mentality, in which we kind of ingrandize ourselves, lose, lose the plot lines altogether. The problem with sin, the smallest sin, is against an infinitely holy, infinitely just, infinitely righteous God, and in transgression of a perfectly holy law. This is the grievousness of the sin. Think, children, for a second, and this is a this this analogy has very limited scope. But if if a brother tells another brother not to do something, and the brother does it anyway, well, that's one thing. 
But if daddy says not to do something and you do it, it is worse, isn't it? It's more heinous in that case. Well, when we sin, we are ultimately sinning against God, right? The, the evil of sin is to be seen against who, who it is, is against. God could have said that things were to be different. In other words, he could have uh, set the parameters for Adam's obedience differently than he, he did. But in his wisdom, he chose the path that he did. And Adam's, Adam's sin is worse than any of us imagine. You think of Eve. Eve is deceived. Adam was not deceived. We read that from 1 Timothy 2. Eve was deceived. 1 Timothy 2 told us Adam was not deceived. Adam disobeyed without deception. Not that his deception would have excused him any. And so his sin is worst. One, he did it without being deceived. He saw what he was doing in his transgression. The transgression of the one, as Romans 5 verse 14 says. He did it with his wife. So he didn't detect the problem, defend uh, his wife, persuade her, warn her, physically restrain her even. So he's guilty for that as well. And he hearkened to her voice rather than God's voice. And he did not submit himself to the Lord. But he is, his sin is especially evil because his sin was as the representative of the human race as the federal head of all humanity, which makes it worst of all. His sin, if you will, damned all of humanity apart from the intervention of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sin, of course, is also not just a, a bodily action, right? There are all sorts of elements that are involved in terms of intentions and so on and you know many of our reformed fathers people like Turretin would say you know the source was unbelief right the first sin was was unbelief that led to or was expressed in the eating of the the forbidden the forbidden fruit so we need to understand something of the nature of this temptation the nature of sin in the temptation but we then want to focus secondly on the pattern of temptation looking more specifically at this passage, the pattern of temptation. Just to review very briefly, we saw last week that the devil began with a question. He didn't come out with a declaration. He was more subtle than that. He came out with a question. He drew Eve into a conversation. He drew Eve into fellowship with himself. She should have been giving herself entirely to communion with God and communion with her holy husband, and in the path of duty in terms of responsibilities that God had given. But she's drawn by this question, which is uh, very disarming. She's brought into conversation, and then we see the devil distorting God's word. We noted last week that that distortion of God's word was actually a distortion of the character of God himself, casting shade on the Lord himself. You'll notice that he did not mention the tree at first, right? He's, he's drawing her attention away uh, initially. The woman, of course, is set off balance. She then uh, begins to shift from sound footing on the word of God, and she adds to Scripture. And then when she's off kilter, the devil comes with a direct contradiction, and he flagrantly contradicts the word of God, calling God, in essence, a liar. We noted that Adam took an indirect approach, that, that the devil took an indirect approach. Rather than going straight to Adam, who was the ultimate target, he went through Eve in order to use her position with Adam as a means of, of toppling him. So now we come in verse 6. And now she is looking at the tree itself, right? The dialogue has ceased. And she's standing within sight of the tree. When the woman saw that the tree was good 
for food. But notice that she is looking at the tree through the devil's lens. She is not looking at it through the lens of God's revealed word. So if she was looking at it from the lens of God's word, she would have looked at that tree and she would have abhorred it in a sense, abhorred the thought of taking it from it. She would have viewed it as what is prohibited from her. She would have esteemed God and his glory in, in, in not taking to eat of, of that tree. But she begins to look at it differently. She's now looking at it through the lens of the devil himself. And she thinks to herself, well, in, in many ways, perhaps it didn't look any different than any of the other trees outwardly. And she begins to consider some of its characteristics. And it does not seem to substantiate God's command. And what's happening in those opening phrases of chapter 6? In her heart, she is viewing God as a liar. She's saying, actually, it looks good and it looks pleasant and it looks like it will deliver something that is to benefit to me. It'll give me wisdom. She's in her heart beginning to think of God as the liar, God as the enemy, that God is the one who is restricting something from her that she needs, that she would benefit from, that she desires and so on. Which means that she's also looking at Satan as a friend. You know, he's told me how to see it. He's helping me. So there's this wicked, perverse distortion. You know, the evil that is taking place, good being called evil, evil being called good. And it's almost as if she's applying the scientific method, right? The scientific method is, is, is fine as far, as far as it goes. But she's applying the scientific method in a position of independence from God. Right? You can take numbers, you can take logic, you can take all sorts of things that are helpful and use them independently of God in ways that are, 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 are wrong. And she's doing that. She's assessing the, 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 the circumstances here. She sees it. Notice how it's sensual, sensual in the sense of in, engaging her senses. The woman saw that the tree was good. And what I want you to notice here is that it is actually following the path. The first temptation and the first sin is, is following the pattern that John gives us. That it's actually a pattern that is repeated over and over and over throughout history in lots of different forms. If you look at 1 John 2, verse 16 and 17, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, the relevance of those words in light of our text is very intriguing on its own. But I want you to notice that threefold breakdown that we have there. Uh, the, 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 the lust of the uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, you see this. There's this same pattern. She saw that it was good for food. This is the lust of the flesh. An example of the lust of the flesh. It goes on. And that it was pleasant, desirable, to the eyes. This is the lust of the eyes that is spoken of clearly. And then it says, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Well, this is the pride of life. Right? You see that same biblical pattern right here in the very first sin and the very first temptation. Now, you can actually take that and you can trace it in a lot of different places throughout the Bible. Another example would be, the preeminent example would be the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes into the wilderness, he fasts and prays 40 days, 40 nights, and the devil comes to him in that condition of physical deprivation to tempt him. And he comes with three separate temptations. We noted last week how you have the first Adam 
who is not following the word of God. You have the last Adam and the Lord Jesus Christ in response to every one of those temptations says, it is written, right? He answers with the word of God. He's anchored in the word of God. But notice this threefold pattern here as well. Satan comes to him and, uh, and, and seeks to coax him to turn stones to bread. I mean, he's 40 days, he's been fasting and so on. But this is an appeal, a temptation to the lust of the flesh. He's told to jump off the pinnacle of the temple and the angels will catch him. In other words, do this grand miracle. Well, this is a, an appeal to the lust of the eyes. And then the devil comes and says, bow down and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Here's the pride of life, right? You see that same basic pattern. And it's, it's found here at the very, very beginning. And notice each of the steps. She saw, she took, she did eat, and she gave. See those four things? So the, the devil comes and appeals through the, the eye gate, as our forefathers would say, right? There's all sorts of gates that take us into the soul, ear gate and eye gate and so on. And so there's an appeal to, to the eyes, she looks upon it, it's attractive, it's enticing, it looks, it looks to be beautiful and as if it's going to give her all sorts of pleasure and so on. That leads to action. She took it. And then you have the culmination in her eating it, which is what was forbidden specifically. And then all sin breeds itself, right? Sin is never content to remain by itself. And so she having transgressed God's commandment, gave it to her husband, right? She's spreading. Sin's nature is to spread like a virus or a plague or, or whatever. And if you look at James, just to help you put the pieces together, you'll see in James chapter 1, these will be well-known words to you. In James chapter 1, uh, you read there of the, the, the nature of, of temptation. It says in, in verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. You're not to say that you're tempted of God. And then here's the description. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So he's drawn away. That's the first thing. Enticed is the second thing. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. All of these are corroborating the same pattern that we, we, we see here. What's happening? Eve is listening to the creature and not the creator. So there's all these sirens going off and all this noise that is happening. And she's listening to what the creature has to say and not being deaf to that voice and alive and attentive to God's voice. Well, the same thing happens over and over and over again, right? The believer finds himself in circumstances and there's this appeal. And many times it does come through the eye gate, not only. But uh, something is seen and it begins to arouse and you think, well, there's something desirable here and there's something attractive here and there's something that is pleasurable here. And then that leads to taking it and then, you know, committing the sin itself. And then that sin can't be contained. It spills out into other things and affects other people and so on. And all the while, the Christian has taken his or her eyes off of the Lord, the fear of God, God consciousness, God centeredness has not been looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of the faith, but begins looking at toying with sin. And so you, you see something happen and it, it stirs up in a bitter, a bitter thought. And you think, well, here we go. And you, you begin to nurse that or you, 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 you see something you desperately want. You're greedy for it. And you, you know, the sight of that, or it can be immoral things. It can be provoked to anger by, by things. But it doesn't matter what the particular sin is. There's a failure to listen to the word of God, to subject oneself to the word of God. There's pride in every sin. 
that says we do not need to be submitting ourselves to the Word of God and listening to Him. You think about the nature of this test. God has put His people, He's put Adam on probation. He set before him the terms for the covenant of works. And you think about the nature of this test. You know, the devil has said, you will know good and evil. You'll be like God. Well, wait a second here. Hold on. They already know good and evil. They do. They already know good and evil. They know that God's command is good. And they know that he has prohibited them from eating something, that that's evil. But there's already a measure of knowing good and evil. No, that's not really the question. The nature of the test is whether they're going to obey in dependence upon God or whether they're going to act independent of God. Are they going to seek something independent of him or are they going to receive from him by his holy law and word dependent upon him. So you see this pattern. Notion that this is a seemingly small thing is fallacious. The wages of sin is death. I doubt that anyone here looks upon a dead body as an insignificant thing. Well, this is universal deadness that we're looking upon. It is treason against an altogether good and an infinitely holy God. We should also say something here about the, the roles that the men and women that both Adam and Eve have in this circumstance. <clears throat> You'll see that she takes it, she eats it, and she gives it to her husband, and he does eat. So in this case, the woman is leading the man. She is the one leading the man, not the man leading the woman. Now, Adam is the one who's culpable, of course. I mean, he's, he bears his own culpability. He's, not, he's responsible for both spiritually and physically protecting his wife. He is, God has entered into a covenant with him as Adam. And he has a responsibility to protect her and, uh, you know, to hem her in. But she has gone off in her own direction here, and he is following her. And we, we note something in terms of God's order. The, now, I'm talking about the order of nature. I'm talking about his created order, something that God had established prior to the fall and prior to sin, the headship of man, and so on. What we learn from the very beginning is that when women are leading in ways that God has called men to do, when women are leading, it is not good for the women. Right? There's this, there's this tension because everyone has sinful nature. Men are going to be naturally male chauvinists and want to think that they're better and use their power and and, and so on and so forth. And you have women are going to be naturally feminists left to themselves and, and so on. So it's, you know, both have the same root problem that take different expressions. But in this case, when the woman is the one leading, it's actually not good for the woman. The, the way that it's often put is, well, women are trying to, you know, demand what belongs to them at the expense of men. But I want you to think biblically, it's at the expense of women. You following me? It's at the expense of women, not just men. And it's at the expense of children because she is not pursuing what's in the best interest of her posterity either. And in that sense, and we're not going to spend time on this today, feminism is the most anti-woman movement in the history of the world. Right? We're turning things on their head we're turning the typical rhetoric on its head. We're actually turning it biblically right side up. Feminism is anti-woman. It is against the best interests of, of women. Now, I've preached on the fact that women and men inherit you know, properties and, 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 and there are things where 
Obviously, in terms of gifts and godliness and so on, there's equality. But in terms of role, God has made a distinction, and no man has the ability to, to change that in terms of their role. And in the, 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 the movements of, of feminism are not just undermining men. They're undermining children. They're undermining the women and so on. It's a grasp for power. I think it's often put, you know, in terms of women's power, they're grasping power in order to bring man down. When in fact, when they grasp things that God hasn't given them, they're bringing themselves down. In this case, all is lost. It's actually a move toward becoming powerless. So we need to get this right in our head, you know, because the church is shot through and infected with feminism, right? The world's influences are leaking into the church. I mean, no one, biblical Christianity has the highest place and position for women in the whole world in terms of their dignity and in terms of their, all of the contributions that they have to make some of the most powerful influences in the whole world within the, within the, within the parameters that God has, has created for them. But when those are broken, just as it's the same case when men uh, break the parameters God's given to them. It creates havoc. And so we need to think biblically here. We need to take our cue, not from hearing the creature, but from hearing the creator. So we see something of the pattern of temptation. Thirdly, we see the result of that temptation, which is man's fall. The last words of the text, and he did eat those four words, I mean, in English, you have three letters, two letters, three letters, three letters, right? There's just a handful of letters there in the English language, and he did eat. But it's in that, those, that very, very, very tiny phrase that we have the fall of mankind. It's in those words, and he did eat. Adam listened, in this case, to his wife, which was to listen to the lie of the devil uh, Eve was deceived, and Adam uh, disobeyed. The fall comes when Adam eats, right? He is the one who is the representative of the human race. He is the one who is party within the covenant of works with God. Man did not call, mankind did not fall until the end of verse 6. It is when Adam ate the forbidden fruit. You say, well, pastor, when was that? You know, when did he eat it? What's our, what's our chronology here? What, what time is it? Well, we can't be terribly dogmatic. We, well, we can be dogmatic about a few things. We can say, first of all, it wasn't on the sixth day. We know that much. Because at the end of the sixth day, God says, all is very good. Right? God could not say all is very good if it had been if the fall had taken place on the sixth day. So it was either on the seventh day or thereafter. But the scripture doesn't give us a definitive answer. I mean, there are people who speculate that using various passages, but there's nothing that is, is terribly definitive. It's here in these words, and he did eat, that the covenant of works is broken. So this covenant, God... God could have created his, you know, creatures. He could have created mankind. They would have been bound uh, to responsible submission and obedience to him. God had condescended to, to deal with Adam by way of covenant. It's not something that he had to do. The guy was obliged or obligated to do. But he had entered into a covenant of works and had set before him the offer of a confirmation of holiness and eternal life through obedience, or the condemnation of death, temporal and eternal, through disobedience. Adam broke the covenant of works. It's shattered. And it is only possible for God to come and to recover this by means of a different covenant. And we'll get to that later on in this chapter when we get to, to um, verse 15. We have, the, we have the beginning of the covenant of works where God establishes a covenant to recover 
a people for himself, to save them, to bring them to himself, and then to f reconcile them and to restore fellowship with them. That is only possible through the covenant of grace. With the covenant of works broken, it is never again a path to life. It is never again a means through which anyone could obtain life. I also want you to note that in, <clears throat> in these words, and he did eat, you have him eating the forbidden fruit. You also have him breaking all ten commandments. And he did eat. He broke all ten commandments. Now, children will know from their catechism, and, and we've covered this in other places of Scripture, Adam had the whole moral law in the garden. Right? He had the whole moral law, which is summarized in the Ten Commandments later on in the days of Sinai. And it's written on his heart. And it's not difficult to show how he broke all Ten Commandments. Think with me. First commandment. He had another God. Right? Satan. He's listening to the voice of the creature. His wife is a creature and Satan. Rather than having God as the one who has sole authority. Second commandment. He idolized his palate. He esteemed the creature over the creator. He, he looked and says, it's good, it's pleasant, it's desired to make one wise, and he esteemed those things. He idolized something, put them in place of, of God. Was God enough? God was more than enough to satisfy him overwhelmingly to his heart's content and beyond for all of time and eternity. But he sought an idol. He made an idol of the fruit. Third commandment, he failed to believe God's threat and thereby sanctify God's name. So he, he, he broke with the ordinance and command that God get, gave him and thus took the name of God in vain. Fourth commandment, he broke from the state of sinless rest in which he found himself. It's possible this took place on the Sabbath. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But he broke from the rest, the sinless rest that God had created him with. Fifth commandment is straightforward. He dishonored and disobeyed his heavenly father by eating of the fruit. Sixth commandment. He brought death to himself, murdered himself and his posterity, in essence. Seventh commandment. He's lusting after this fruit. It's the appetites that the... Our catechism talks about with regards to unchaste appetites. He is, it's a form of spiritual adultery. Eighth commandment, he's stealing what did not belong to him, what had been prohibited and withheld from him. Ninth commandment, he believed a lie. He did not believe the truth that God had given him. And the tenth commandment is obvious. He coveted what was not his he coveted what was not his. All ten commandments broken in eating the forbidden fruit. And the result of this temptation is the fall of man. I mean, if you were to think of a, you know, some of the greatest civilizations, I mean, we have a hard time picturing it. Babylon was beyond your wildest imaginations in terms of civilization. The level of advance that they had, the level of wealth that they had, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's astounding when you begin to put the pieces together from the historical record. Uh, amazing. And you think, of course, of the, you think of the Persians or the Romans, or you can go on down through history and think of the various, you know, various Prussians and the Ottomans and on and on it goes, right? British Empire, American Empire. Some great, some pretty great um, empires, massive wealth, massive power, massive accomplishments, and so on. And when you think about the dismantling of any of these empires, none of them has ever lasted, right? None of them has lasted. The greatest, the ones that were way better than America is at present, haven't lasted. Right? None of those empires have lasted. But you think about the, the dismantling of those empires, having been raised up so incredibly high and after being cast into the dust, brought down so incredibly low, obliterated, scattered, you know, left in ruins. And it's, it's if, you, if you hold in juxtaposition 
an empire at the height of its wonder, its glory, and then set again over against it that empire in its worst ruins. Right? It's breathtaking to think about it. how can that become that? Well, that analogy doesn't even come, doesn't, isn't even in the same universe with what's happening here in Genesis 3, verse 6. God has created man, brought him in, in his own image, brought him into fellowship with himself, set him in the most immaculate, gorgeous, beautiful environment possible, given him sinless fellowship with himself, given him a helpmeet with sinless communion, you know, laid out all of these things, given him the best work possible in the service of Jehovah, given him promises of eternal life. You know, you, you, you can't even compare it to anything else. So do, please do not skirt the text just because the words are few and he did eat. Do not lose the full force of what is happening, the dismantling of the state of innocency and of the fall of the entire human race. It's unparalleled. And it should overwhelm us. It should take our breath away. We should be astonished by it. We should have a greater abhorrence for sin. We should have a greater sense of our need for salvation, a greater wonder at the sending of a Redeemer. I mean, at this point, God could have said, story over. Adam goes to hell. Eve goes to hell, body and soul. And the whole posterity of the human race goes to hell. Think about that. God was not compelled by something external to himself to save any. Yet wonder of wonders is it not as we progress through this chapter to discover that he remembers mercy and that in his sovereign good pleasure he is prepared to open up a way that he has decreed from before the foundation of the world to save and elect people for himself and to draw them into fellowship with him. The chapter ends with the great expulsion, Adam driven by God out of, out of his presence, out of the garden, out of fellowship. And in Christ, the sons of Adam, the elect, drawn back into fellowship and into communion with the Lord. Indeed, given at the cost of Christ himself, the eternal life which excels all that Adam knew. So we see the result of this temptation is man's fall. And while it is a truly unique event, right? I mean, unique in the proper sense, a one of a kind, never to be repeated event. It is a unique event. And yet it gives us these preliminary features that will be repeated over and over and over again. We do well to study it because it helps us to understand the nature of temptation and the nature of sin in our own context. I mean, Paul makes this point, as I mentioned last, last Lord's Day. He doesn't look back on the historic uh, unfolding of these events in Genesis chapter 3 as merely a historic curiosity. He tells the, he tells the Corinthians, this is as relevant to you as it is to anyone else. He says in verse 3, chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, For, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We have lessons to lay up in our hearts here. And the temptation for the unconverted is to turn their ear away from the word of God to not listen to what God says about them. You know, you can hear the word of God, my friend, and you can nod at it without actually receiving it into your bosom. What is reality with regards to your condition before God? What is reality with regards to eternity and a heaven to be won and a hell to be lost? What is true with regards to who Christ is and his ability to save? There are a million other voices that say this is important, this is enjoyable, this is what will satisfy, and they're all competing voices from the creature. 
And in this text, you're being called to give heed to the voice of the Creator Himself. And the price tag is death or life for you. Death or life. Let God be true, though all men be liars. We believe, help thou our unbelief. These are the cries that ought to go forth. And for the Christian as well, every single sin, however small or big you may consider them to be, every one of them is an act of treason. And every one of them is in defiance against a good and holy God. And for the Christian, the true Christian, it is against the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood. We have to think rightly about the nature of temptation, to be led rightly by the light and truth of God's liberating word. May he grant us grace to do so. Let's stand for prayer. Lord our God in heaven, we are a foolish, foolish people. We are a short-sighted people. We are dull people. Deliver us, O Lord, from the foolishness of sin. Break into our hearts and minds. Pour light and grace. The knowledge of Christ a heart that is inclined toward the Word of God, to hold fast to it. O oh Lord, arouse and awaken us to these things. Deliver those who find themselves ensnared in sin, who are being drugged, as it were, in a net toward the brink of hell. O oh Lord, burst these nets, set captives free, call sinners to thyself, Bless thy own people, often beaten and battered in the war with sin. Lord, lift up the hearts and heads of thy people to look to the Lord Jesus Christ as the great deliverer. May he receive the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll respond to the reading and preaching of God's word by singing from Psalm 51, verses 5 to 8, to the tune Kilmarnock, which is number 70. Psalm 51, verses 5 to 8, tune number s Kilmarnock is not number 70. Kilmarnock is number 79. So tune number 79. Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I in iniquity was formed the womb within. My mother also me conceived in guiltiness and sin. Verses 5 to 8.
stand for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.